Hey, it's Rav. Welcome to The Everyday Investor, the hottest investment show in the world. That's right. I said it. I don't care who knows it. The challenge often is that we take our precious time, we go to work, we get paid in order to eat. But imagine a life where money could make you money so that you could work a little less, have more time for those things that matter most family, friends, engaging in some sort of purpose greater than yourself. That's what this show is all about, teaching you how to grow your money. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I always like to challenge investors and say, what are you waiting to see? Well, I'm waiting for the prices to go up. Okay, so you're waiting for the price to get higher before you buy? And it's just funny. It's funny how that's our, our first reaction. Hi, it's Darren Mitchell from Control and Compound. If you're a real estate investor or business owner, you know the cookie cutter approach to financial planning doesn't work for you. You've got to be in control of your money. You've got to save and store your money differently than other people. At Control and Compound, we are the wealth coaches for real estate investors and business owners. We show you how to save your money, grow your money tax-free, multiply your money tax-free, and spend it tax-free. To learn more, please check us out at controllingcompound.com forward slash everyday investor, where viewers of this show get a complimentary education session. Hey everyone, welcome back to Everyday Investor, talking to my good friend Kyle Ford. Uh, he is the guru, everything uh, money uh, topic today. It was, we're going to talk about how we can make money investing in a mortgage fund. Kyle, uh, great to see you. Thanks for being on the show with me here. Yeah, always a pleasure, Rob. I'm looking forward to, to talking with you and everyone about uh, about the benefits of investing in a fund. Yes, um, this is um, these are uncertain times, you know, for a lot of people. Um, for for investors, even as well. I know for someone like you, you've uh, you've seen it before, and good times are. Uh, coming back, but uh, let's talk a little bit about you know the the, the state of the economy or uh, variable rates or or you know what are what are you sensing out there and what would you say paternally uh, to people that are you know a little bit afraid worried? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I, you know we're we're in the, the fall of 2023 right now, and uh, the, the the markets are have cooled. I mean, we're hearing the word cool, step back. Uh, in some markets, they have largely declined. Um, you know, I want to start by saying I'm not predicting any type of major crash in terms of Canadian real estate. Uh, but in terms of this cool off that we've seen, um, it, it is here and it is kind of resetting the price values. Um, I think what we need to be cognizant of is when we're investing in real estate or, or buying real estate right now, we just need to have a longer time horizon. So is now the time to flip? If you're a professional, maybe you can get some good deals now. But if you're a first timer and you're getting into the real estate market, I think you should have a longer trajectory on your holding period. I think we're going to look back in five and 10 years and identify right now as one of the, the best times to buy real estate. Though, if you read the headlines or watch the news, et cetera, it can, be, it can be a little bit scary to pull the trigger. I think the other thing we're seeing is a lot of, uh, how do I say this? A lot of you go first. So I'll give you an example of that where people are a little bit scared to, to be the first one to do it. We've had a couple of properties personally that we've listed right now that have been on the market for two months without any offers and then go into multiples. So it's they were priced well, priced fair, lots of people interested, nobody went, but when one person went, then everybody went. So I, I see that as a lot of the Canadian way where nobody wants to be the one who overpaid, uh, nobody wants to be the one at the, the, the street party with who paid the most out for the house, nobody wants to be the one with the highest interest rate. So we're seeing a lot of people just kind of waiting to see what somebody else is doing before they, they, they go. Uh, as an investor, you know, it is the time to be a leader. Don't wait for what other people are doing. Run your numbers, have a long-term plan. And, and if the, the file or the deal works for you, then then pull the trigger. And it's still a great time to buy real estate. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the time where I wish I had, 
you know, a big, uh, a bunch of cash sitting there because this is the time. Um, you know, when anybody asks me about the greater Toronto area, um, the fundamentals are all there. I mean, there's way, way, way more demand than there is supply. And um, therefore, we're in business. The only caveat I always give is the government. The government can do whatever they want to to um, manipulate, to curb, to slow down, to speed up. And so that nobody can predict, right? And so when interest rates are, are where they're at, and of course, as investors, both of us, uh, Kyle, um, we don't believe in um, uh, not having the largest mortgage. We want the largest mortgage possible um, because it's basically free money to be able to make money, right? That margin that you're going to teach us here um, in, a, in a few minutes of how, how we can make money. But when rates go up five, six, seven percent, when we're on variable rates, as investors are, we're all kind of like when we get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, uh, it might take a little bit longer to go to bed <laughs> when we're thinking about, oh my goodness, when's this gonna, you know? And so it's not just the everyday um, person; it's also the everyday investor that you and I are both. And so, you know, people are afraid. And I think uh, I want to say for you watching, don't be afraid. This is just a season. Um, this is not, you know, uh, forever. Uh, Kyle, you and I and a few friends, we tried to put on a, you know, big seminar and people are afraid to even come out to that because, you know, they're just like, yes, I'll wait and, and see what happens. Where great investors before us um, or, or that are still with us, uh, a Warren Buffett type, is preaching, this is the time. When people are afraid, this is the time to invest. When when people are, um, you know, not afraid, then perhaps step back. So anyways, I couldn't agree with you um, more. Um, and so, you know, because you're, you're the, the, the master in the mortgage world, if somebody comes to you right now, um, and, and nobody would ever hold this to you, Kyle, they're not a crystal ball. Again, the government's incredibly unpredictable. What, what would they do with their high variable rate? Should they lock into a fixed for a year? Wait it out. What are your thoughts? Again, uh, nobody's holding you to this, but what are your thoughts? What's Kyle doing? Yeah, well, I want to I want to address the one comment you made as well about the the wait and see that we're seeing for a lot of people. I always like to challenge investors and say, "What are you waiting to see?" Well, I'm waiting for the prices to go up. Okay, so you're waiting for the price to get higher before you buy. And it's just funny, it's funny how that's our, our first reaction, but why are we waiting for it to get higher before we buy? If we think we're low right now, let's buy now. So, and I guess that advice is similar to the answer about what to do with the variable rates right now. I talk about this a lot. If we treat our, our, our decisions around fixed and variable a lot like, you know, investing in real estate or investing in, in sorry, I shouldn't say real estate, investing in the stock market. You don't want to buy at the top of the stock market, then the market come down and then sell. That's panic selling. And that, that's where a lot of people get in trouble with investing in the stock market. The variable fixed decision is a lot the same. If you took a variable rate two years ago versus now, you've seen a dramatic increase in either your payment or the amount of money going to principal. In some cases, no money going to principal and interest actually accruing on you. So to sell your variable and go with a fixed at the what might be the peak of the market, talks of another quarter point still out there, um, you know, mixed opinions in the professional world about whether that's a good idea or not, or whether a lot of Canadians can, can withstand that, but it is still the conversation being had. Um, to, to, to lock into a long-term fixed rate now, to me, is not the best decision. Uh, what I talk to a lot of my clients about is, is, is check out the shorter-term fixed. Look at a one, two, three. I call it more of the sleep-at-night solution. It might not be the financially best thing to do to lock in right now at today's rates, but if you're going to, excuse me, sleep at night better and your spouse is going to sleep at night better because of it, uh, if you can go back to sleep a little bit quicker after going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, um, then I think a shorter term solution is good, like a shorter term fixed solution. Myself personally, I, I, I have uh, what's called static variables, 
which means my payments aren't moving, just more money is going towards interest. The only property that that's really a negative on is my primary residence because it's not deductible. But any of my investment properties, even that accruing interest is all deductible. And I get to keep better cash flow right now, which is which is really the the lifeline that more longer term investors need, which is positive cash flow, surplus income to help weather the storm. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to give a one size one size fits all band aid solution about what you should do right now. But the, the the one common advice I'm going to give to everybody is reach out to your professional, reach out to myself, reach out to your broker. If it's even your bank, reach out to them and get options about what you can do. Um, and the options may not be the best long term, but there might be something shorter term that are just going to help you help you weather the storm a little bit better. Okay, so Kyle's now um, in Australia because it's uh, warmer there in the winter. His uh, uh, adult nephew. Uh, even though you're young, you wouldn't have an adult nephew, but your adult nephew calls and says, Kyle, who do I speak to? Who am I talking to? Because that's great advice that you gave, but Kyle, you know, and I want to say this respectfully to, uh, to all the other people out there and colleagues out there, but there's a lot of nonsense also being taught. There's a lot of junk being taught. So who does your nephew teach? What are we looking for in a credible advisor when it comes to a lot of this stuff? Because Kyle's not around. Great question. Well, I want to start with where a lot of people go first, which is the bank. They go to their bank. And, and I think it's important, and I'm not going to, you know, poo-poo the bank here because there's lots of, you know, banks have a lot of great products for us. There's a lot of wonderful people who work for banks. But I think it's important that you know when you go to the bank, who the bank works for. The bank works for the shareholders. So it, the advice that they're giving is in the best interest of the shareholders of the bank. Depending on who you're dealing with at the bank, they may or may not even have a fiduciary responsibility for it to you. So it's really important when you're going to the bank and you're getting options that you are, you're understanding that the bank is a business, they are selling products, and their products are, are based on, their products are profitable, and they are driven by their shareholders to, to maximize that profit. So if you're dealing with the same person at the bank for a long time, it might be time for you to seek an external, an external um, opinion from somebody else who might be able to help and just give you different perspective. If you're, if you're dealing, getting the same advice all the time and you're getting the same result, it might be time for a different opinion now. I would certainly encourage, you know, you know, with a, with a shameless plug for myself, but reach out to, you know, myself, my team, there are many great mortgage brokers across the country who are independent, who don't work for one specific bank. They work for multiple lenders and can provide more than one solution. Even if you have a great banker, even if you have a wonderful person at the bank, they only have what's on the bank product shelf. When you start to work with an independent, they can offer multiple products, and multiple solutions. I'll give you some specific advice right now that we're seeing more and more. I'm seeing people staying in a, a mortgage product because they have a really good fixed rate, like a really good fixed rate, but they're drowning in other payments. And they don't want to make a change to that mortgage because the rate's so good, but if they refinanced right now and took a higher rate, their net cost of borrowing would go substantially down from their other expenses. So this is a consideration that you need to make and hear brokers say this all the time that rate is the most important thing. And that's an example of that. So um, the, the other thing, you know, reach out to your accounting teams. So whoever's doing your accounting and your taxes, have a conversation about that. If we're talking to an investor who is maybe in a deal that's potentially not going to be profitable if they sell, it, what do you do? Well, if, for example, you have a, a, a property or a project that you're in that's not particularly profitable and you have a deal that it, you made a lot of money, but you don't want to pay your taxes on, you don't want to pay capital gains on by selling, it could be a possibility that you could sell both at the same time and use the loss to offset the gain, gain and potentially get out of both deals at the same time. This is something that we're talking with investors a lot about right now to free up cash 
to take advantage of new buying opportunities. No, I mean, Kyle, that's what I love about you. There's no emotion. It's all numbers. I mean, even to say have a higher rate, but in the long run, your monthly is going to be lower. Your outlay, your outlay is going to be more. Um, is going to be lower, and so therefore you can free up a little bit more. Um, but it doesn't look like that when we're changing our mortgage, and that's why it's important to uh, to speak to the experts like you, who will pick up their phone if they were in Australia. So thank you for for doing that, and for yeah. all the viewers. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll uh, see how we can make some cash flow um, with our cash, with our registered funds. If you have RSPs, TFSAs, Lira, just sitting there doing. Uh, not much. Um, Kyle has a great solution. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Rav. A few years back, I learned about trading stock options by taking the Theta Trading course. My son, my friends, myself, all of us benefited immensely by applying their strategies. And I want you to have that same benefit by taking their course as well. I'm not receiving any monetary benefit whatsoever by telling you this. It's just that, as you know, I believe that knowledge mitigates risk. Visit their site to find out more. Hey, it's Rav. Welcome back to The Everyday Investor. Speaking to my good buddy, Kyle Ford, uh, when it comes to money and mortgages, investments, uh, wealth of knowledge. Kyle, thanks for being on the show. We kind of, um, in the beginning of the show here, the first half, talked about your thoughts and what people could do. And the biggest thing I heard is um, just get good advice um, and don't panic. This is just a season. So thank you for uh, nurturing us with that. Let's talk about uh, CapGap. Uh, what is CapGap? And uh, you know, how do we um, um, invest and make a few bucks with CapGap? Yeah, it's super exciting to talk about it. Uh, so CapGap Mortgage Trust is our private income fund. I just want to start by saying the conversation we're going to have is not a solicitation to invest. Before investing any money, you have to get independent legal advice. We have an offering memorandum, declaration of trust, and all the paperwork that you can review. Just want to speak a little bit generally high level, answer some, some questions for you. Um, but yeah, CapGap Mortgage Trust is our mortgage income fund. Uh, we have spent the better part of two years creating it. Uh, and this was the, the, the brain trust of some people that uh, I've worked with closely and intimately for the last number of years and really developing what we believe is, is the future of private lending and how the everyday investor, the everyday Canadian can invest their cash, registered accounts, whatever it may be, into secured real estate deals. So securing your money on real estate. Okay, so this is private lending. And in a nutshell, explain just the concept of private lending. So essentially, like starting with lending, most people are familiar with lending, they go to their bank. So if they need a mortgage, they need a car loan, they need whatever that may be, they go to their bank and the bank underwrites a loan. Now, what I think a lot of us are, understand now is that market or that going to the bank has become very tight and restrictive. So the private lending market is essentially you, Rav, being the bank. Kyle's gonna, Kyle needs money. He's doing a real estate deal. He's going to come. He went to the bank. The bank will do the deal, but they're a little bit slow. They are a little bit lower on loan to value. They need a lot of documents. So Kyle's going to go to you, Rav, and say, Rav, I'm looking for money for my deal, but I'm willing to pay you a little bit more because you can move quicker and you require less conditions. Okay, so Kyle comes to Rav, um, or actually Kyle goes through probably in this case uh, a broker, um, you know, such as uh, Kyle Ford, CapGap, and um, uh, Kyle needs $100,000, um, and then therefore, uh, I, I see that, okay, there's a project here, there's um, some great equity, it feels secure to me, I'm even going to put a lien there, uh, Kyle's paying for legal fees, um, and Rav says, no problem, Kyle, I'd love to lend you $100,000. Um, what are the terms generally, and what kind of returns does Rav make on the $100,000? Yeah, so when, when, when Rav lends Kyle directly the money, Rav is secured on property 123 Main Street, whatever that is. Kyle pays all of the legal fees for it. 
And generally, we're doing a one-year deal at approximately a 12% interest rate. Wow. So one okay. year at 12%. And when you say when you say uh, secured on uh, property, what do you mean by that? What does that mean, secured on property? You have a registered mortgage position, so you are registered just like when you go when you and your family go get a mortgage from the bank, and the bank is registered against your house. It's the exact same situation, except in this case, Rav is now the bank. Now, this is, this is the main difference between traditional private lending and CAPGA. In a traditional private lending deal, RAV is, RAV is secured on this one specific property. With CAPGA, you're invested into the fund, and the fund is secured across multiple properties. What that means is if one deal were to go into default or payments weren't made, or there's a delay, it's not as, it's diversified across multiple mortgages, which means you as the lender are less affected. Instead of not getting any payment, you're getting a little bit less payment. Instead of not getting any money back, there's a potential you get a little bit less back. So it's really diversifying and spreading your risk across multiple private lending scenarios. And Kyle, how does this differ from a private REIT, a real estate investment trust? What's the difference between a real estate investment trust and this mortgage trust, if you will? Amazing question. A real estate investment trust is an equity position, which means your return is based off of the rent and the appreciation of the property but it's also negatively affected by depreciation of the property, vacancy, construction costs, maintenance overrun, and other variable factors. The key difference between an equity fund and an income fund is our returns are derived from fixed income debt contracts. So when we get our investors money, we are lending it secured on real estate at returns above our target. So if there's construction overrun, delays, any of those things, as long as our interest is still collected, the profitability of the project may have changed, but our return to our investors hasn't. Okay, so Rav is um, now not uh, putting his money with uh, Kyle. He is lending to in... Uh, cap gap or cap gap has many uh, mortgages. It's a debt play. There's a fixed return, um, and I'm secured on all those properties for my protection. Correct. Correct. Exactly. And you're, and you're saying right now, general, like you know, if we were to take a hundred uh, k right now, um, this is a uh, twelve percent annual. Um, kind of uh, fee. Uh, we're doing a one year and this is paid up front. This is paid monthly. This is paid quarterly. Do I get to choose? How does Rav get to enjoy his uh, $12,000 of profit in that one year? Yeah. So we have two options. So we have, so first of all, we have three share classes. Okay. And the three share classes are, have targeted returns. So they are not guaranteed returns. They are targeted returns of 8, 11, or 14%. Okay. Okay. So we have a range in terms of rate of return. So what's the difference? You said 8, 11, or 14% on my 100 grand. I can uh, make 8 grand a year, 11 grand a year, $14,000 a year projected returns without encroaching my 100 whatsoever. Correct. So um, 8% is first position mortgages only. So there's no other mortgage. There's no bank involved. There's no so on and so forth. So therefore, um, you know, if I'm in first position and there's a lot of equity there, that's why uh, you feel like 8% is a fair projected return. Yes. And the 8% uh, fund is something that we really created to attract people who aren't as familiar in real estate. 
Uh, there are people who have been lending their money for a lot of years and expect the double digit returns and are willing to take a little bit more risk to do that. We want it to be available to the masses. So the, the share class A, the first position, 8%, is our most conservative fund. Share class B or two at the 11% is first and second mortgages. So we may take a little bit more risk in that fund in order to get the higher rate of return. Okay. And when you say risk, what does that mean? So, for example, being in second position means there's a lender in front of you. Yeah. So in the event of a default, they get paid before you. Yeah. Now, we certainly are doing our due diligence and underwriting to make sure that there's some equity there to lend on. But by definition, if there's a lender in front of you, there's a greater risk. But really what you're talking about is we've got a million dollar property and the, the bank has the first mortgage at 600,000 and then RAV's in there or CapCap's in there with RAV's money, uh, 200,000. So there's 200,000 left of equity. So the bank lent out 600, RAV's putting out 200, it's worth a million, so there's $200,000 worth of equity. Am I fine with a 80-20 loan to value? And if I'm fine with that, that's my risk, um, and I'm rewarded 11% projected return annualized. Annually, right? Correct. Okay, and then yeah. tell me about 14%. Yeah, so 14% is first, second, and by definition, we can do third mortgages, though it's not our, our core competency and not what we're looking to do regularly, but by definition, we can. The main difference with the 14% fund is we have the ability to do construction financing, which means we are actually lending on future value. So if we have a million dollar property, but after we spend two to $300,000 on construction, it's worth 1.5. We can actually use share class C at that much higher rate of return to fund that construction. So by definition, this is the most risky fund this also is it has the greatest potential for capital loss. So I just want to be very upfront with the, with folks. Now, we have very strict underwriting for share class C, and we have a, a, a construction draw program to mitigate that. Uh, but th this is where we are finding a lot of investors who are, are more experienced in private lending. This is the type of uh, share class that they, they like to be involved in and the rates of returns that they're they're used to participating. Yeah. Kyle, time's up here. We've got to go. Before I let you go, uh, one of the exciting things I also like about private lending is people can use their registered funds, correct? They can use their, their TFSA, their RSP, their RESP, their Lira, um, even work pension, uh, depending. Um, but they can point that and, and lend that as well. While it stays in, it's registered, meaning you don't have to pull it out. It stays within that vehicle and... Um, uh, they're not taxed on it. Is that right or no? Correct, correct. If, if, you, if you lend in, lend in or invest in cash, the return is paid to you in cash and, and it's taxable. If you invest through your registered account, the return is paid back into that registered account, which is a tax a deferral strategy, or in the case of a TFSA, a tax-free strategy. Uh, and we are absolutely eligible to, to work with those accounts. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to myself and team. We want to make sure that you're fully informed and getting the proper counsel and advice before investing any money into the fund. Kyle, thank you so much for being on the show with me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Thank you guys at home for watching. Without you, we wouldn't have a show. Uh, great episode. And please, uh, you have my uh, uh, blessings to reach out to Kyle. And I say that. You've never really heard me say that for other shows. I say that because Kyle is a wealth of knowledge. So reach out to his, uh, him and his team uh, to be further nurtured. But thank you for watching the show. Go to everydayinvestor.com to uh, watch more. Sign up for our, our weekly uh, uh, letter there. You'll get these shows right in your inbox. Until then, we'll see you next week. Same place, same time. Honey, love you. I'll be home soon. Thanks for watching, everyone. 